Welcome to Taking the Tradition On. Um, it's a series of conversations about all st storytelling with exceptional people. We are currently on to series four, Words in the Works, which is all about applied storytelling. Storytelling in huge numbers of different spheres and disciplines. All of the previous series are all on my YouTube channel, um, Taking the Tradition On, and they're all free. So feel free at any point to just go and have a little wander through. There's some amazing people on there. Have a listen whenever you would like. And if you do like Taking a Tradition On, please do subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, as always, I would like to say thank you very much to my wonderful, wonderful patrons who make this possible and give me the time to be able to spend keeping on going with taking this tradition on um and if you would like to join them you can just go to patron slash amy douglas um which is what janice did so welcome to my brand new patron janice it is great to have you on board um and lots of other things happen over on patreon there's an advent calendar going on at the moment we have a story or a riddle every day um you're always the first to know who will be next on taking the tradition on and you can also recommend and suggest people that you'd like to hear so tonight, I've got a very, very, very special guest. All my guests are special, but I am particularly excited about tonight. We are going to look at the role of storytelling in archaeology and anthropology with my fabulous guest, Mary Ann Okotta. Mary Ann is an archaeologist and anthropologist. She's also an author and an adventurer. Her new book, well, newish. 2020, um, but still pretty new and very gorgeous. Uh, Secret Britain, unearthing our mysterious past. Um, so Tony Robinson, this is his, this is his review, which I think is rather marvellous. It's a cornucopia of our weirdest and most wonderful archaeological sites and artefacts. They make you feel proud of these gloriously intriguing isles. So that's what Sir Tony Robinson says. I say. It's just beautiful. It's absolutely gorgeous. Any page you open, there's a beautiful, beautiful photograph on one side and there's stories, information, and it's it's got the usual suspect sites, but it's got lots of things that you wouldn't necessarily expect. Lots of things that I didn't know about. Beautiful artefacts and finds. It's got facts, but it's also got bits of legend. It's got Tintagel and Arthur's Britain. It's a real mix between storytelling, mythology and archaeology and anthropology, which is what we are here to talk about tonight. So please welcome my wonderful, fabulous guest, Mary Ann Akotta. Hello, Mary Ann. Hello, Amy. Thank you so much for having me on. It's, it's a great privilege and slightly intimidating because <laughs> I've seen the calibre of the storytellers and practitioners that you've had on taking the tradition on and they are pretty big boots to fill so hopefully hopefully we're going to have a fun and interesting hour of chat oh i think we are and i don't think you need to be worried or intimidating intimidated all the people here are completely lovely and excited and and you know so much that we don't know i mean this is the great thing i'm really interested in archaeology and anthropology but i'm a complete novice i know very little about it and you're already getting lots of love on the chat oh, for people well, who just nice. love your book saying how brilliant the book is which I completely agree with very kind of you thank you folks so I suppose the first thing is is to give us a little bit of a rundown about about what you do I mean I know what anthropology is in a big term it's the study of cultures and people and archaeology obviously is a study of the ancient past but they're big fields so where is your niche within those worlds? So the thing I guess that differentiates me is that I, I basically have no niche. I'm an absolute, well, I say that I, I'm a generalist. I think um, when you want to work in sort of public facing, effectively the archaeological anthropological version of science education or arts education, you have to be a generalist because, and, and that's, I think, that's who it suits um, most, because I think if you want to really commit your life, your your you know professional energies to one very niche bit of I don't know um, medieval magic and the role of animals in thought, 
which who I know, I know someone who specialises in that, but they're a professor. It sounds fantastic. I it's think what a great really place to specialise. I'm hugely pleased that she's doing it because her research is super fascinating. Um, she's called Sophie Page, uh, Professor Sophie Page, but it is not, <laughs> it's not for me. I'm like, I want to read your book. I want to do a podcast about it, maybe explore those ideas in a documentary, but then I'm perfectly happy to move on to Roman's Toilets um or you know um i've i've had i've had the real um joy and privilege of being able to travel quite broadly through my work and you get spoiled for normal holidays once you've made tv documentaries because basically it's like a pass where you can ask all the nosy questions and go past all the guardrails that say kind of keep out um you know private space or whatever and you're like oh yeah so I'll, I'll be going through through there then and and asking the person who knows all the things or having some kind of incredibly um sort of honest um opportunity to talk to someone who lives in a place um about you know you kind of sit down for tea while they tell you about the rice harvest or something like that stuff that is just much harder to to get to not impossible but harder to get to as a sort of traveler who doesn't have the kind of the ticket of ah the bbc well of course come on in and yes we'll talk to you for six hours also, I think because TV is moderately tedious uh, because you have to shoot different angles and then the camera operator goes off to get all the GVs, the general views, you know, the kind of opening shot of the landscape or the, the house or whatever it is, or vehicles passing on the, the street outside. All that time, you're just on, on location. Now, some people who don't actually like people who do my job find some kind of means of hiding in the corner and not talking to each other or like they nowadays bury themselves in their mobile phone whereas I'm like great I don't need to do tedious tv stuff now I just get to chat or learn or watch or listen or think about what I've heard um and and that I I'd say I mean I'm getting paid for that it's ridiculous um yeah, Jay's just putting on the chat she's just a little bit jealous like oh, every single sure. one of us is all now looking at you going we liked you <laughs> and now we all hate you. <laughs> well, I was just saying to you, Amy, just before this, um, just before this call, um, that I'm I'm like really deep in the bit that I don't like about my job, which is uh, between now and the end of February, I'm not really allowed to go anywhere or do anything fun because I have to finish writing a book. Which, when it's done, I'll be pleased it's done. But in the process of, if anyone, I don't know if you have this experience with writing, I just find it awful it's bloody awful um because I have to sit on my own with a laptop in one place inside it's rubbish I don't get to talk to anyone I have to just think and then type a very first world problem I am very aware that <laughs> I have to say when I'm writing I can't do it like that I have to get I have to get writing buddies um interesting so okay. I have to go like so I, I tend to have a week weekend weekends away with somebody else who's writing and I get loads done then but also I've got like particular mates that I phone up and I talk through what I want to write because I need that rhythm and oh, I need to, once I've talked it through then I can get it down on the page but if I'm sat looking at a blank page I haven't got a hope I just I can't I can't do it yeah Richard's saying I find editing the worst you have to get something yeah editing is hard and proofreading somebody else has to do anyway I, I don't mind editing editing means that I've written something <laughs> so at that point I'm like this is cool <laughs> uh, you have to write first edit second if you try and do the two at the same time you you end up stuck um so you have to write and um my husband's a children's author and he gave me the best advice when I was writing my first book and it was accept and assume sort of embrace effectively the idea that um the first draft is going to be incredibly shit forgive the brutal language it's going to be absolutely rubbish you won't want anyone to see it it'll be embarrassing as you type it but that's okay that's part of the process don't go back just keep going forwards plowing through trudging or or you know kind of going off on a flight of fancy um but accept that the first draft is shit if you got hit by a bus at that point someone would review that file and think you were a terrible writer unless they knew the process of writing in which case they go oh it was a first draft it was all right they were they were all right and now they're dead 
<laughs> you always feel sorry for those people who've like really carefully hidden things in drawers and then like their descendants go oh look we've got this this undiscovered <laughs> book by so and so and like you're just they're turning in the grave going no don't oh, read it that. please well, don't read it reason it stayed in the drawer come on yeah exactly <laughs> oh yes absolutely i think there's there's lots of people agreeing with that yeah. um so so that's the writing side mm -hmm. um, so we're starting to get onto the storytelling bit anyway, but I would love to know, um, because I can imagine that there's a lot of really tedious bits with archaeology, and I know you've got to be really methodical, um, yes. which I can do for a bit, and then and then I lapse. Exactly, so I me too. That's why I'm not a field archaeologist, because a field archaeologist is a combination of being a manual labourer, you have to be like pretty good with a pickaxe, um, but you also have to be incredibly focused on detail. And I'm quite good at manual labor. I'm like, I'm I'm your I'm your girl if if you want to dig a ditch, but I am not the person to very carefully draw a, a plan of a trench or actually kind of get really neat straight sides of a you know a, a section that you're excavating. I'm like, oh well, that'll do. That's all right. Well, this is it. I love, I love the idea of it. But then I kind of sat down and I was thinking about what I was going to do in my life and just went, I really actually, the reality of it, mm. I don't think I'll be any good. And I think I would hate it quite quickly. But mm. what is the most exciting? Because you get to come in when you hear about what other people are doing and kind of swan in and do the best bit. So, <laughs> so what is your, what's the most exciting find that you've been involved with? So to give that, I'll answer that question in a moment, to give that context, the thing that I really love, and again, feels like an absolute privilege of my job, is that I get to take that, that kind of information, that, um, that scientific analysis, the kind of real granularity of, of um, the archaeological science, and then help share it with a wider audience. And that involves putting it into context, giving background, making it come to life in a way that is a, a sort of a different role. It's a different form of translating the facts. And I think that's the bit that I really love. And I'm very aware that for some of my colleagues who are perhaps more focused on, on the, um, I guess, the evidence base, they hate that bit. They're like, oh, the interpretation makes my skin crawl because I don't really know what, what I... I want to say and I want to just stick with with the the kind of the the kind of gritty lab analysis or the calibrated radiocarbon dates or the stratigraphic analysis of this particular trench and I'm like yeah 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 but my mum doesn't particularly and I don't particularly care about that I want to know well what does it mean like what does that tell us about people what does that tell us about the way they lived or what they believed in and which informs why they buried their children around the outside of a church or you know that kind of stuff I'm like that's the bit that gets me excited that that means that I want to get to the end of writing a book so that I can share it with people that when I'm reading a, an archaeological paper, I'm like, oh, that's amazing, because it's that kind of the visceral human interpretation. That's the bit that really gets me gets me excited. The kind of what, what were they thinking? How were they feeling? How did this all make sense in, in human terms? And I think more and more um, professional and academic archaeologists and people, scientists and, and sort of data researchers effectively in lots of other fields are coming around to the fact that that aspect of creating a narrative that gives information context is the thing that enables people to make sense of it and care. So when you come to anthropology or, or kind of human geography, where it's about understanding context in a different place or why people are doing this you know there's an Ebola outbreak in Uganda how do you make sense of how people are feeling about that and perhaps if you're in public health what you do about it in order to help them not get ill for example or you know there's there was a huge kind of anthropological moment around um the COVID pandemic 
because it, it, it is that one of those moments that just stops things dead and forces us to do it differently have some kind of confrontation with the norms that we we previously kind of accepted you know it's just the kind of the thing you do you put your shoes on you go out to work you stand at the train station blah 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 blah, blah. and actually all of a sudden your your that that pattern is broken and it throws up an opportunity to do things differently or understand things differently or try and make sense of it to people desperately searching for a story that makes this all make sense um and i think I think there's a, a, a real appreciation now of the power of storytelling. And you see it a lot in advertising and marketing and, you know, kind of brands, we, you know, we want to tell our story. Um, and it's a it's kind of a much maligned, mis misused term, I think, sometimes. But in terms of science interpretation and interpreting history and heritage, I think it's hugely important because these things are vulnerable to development, to lack of funding, to becoming a niche pursuit for the the kind of the the, the usual suspects um uh, in in the uk in that in terms of heritage that's kind of people who were white middle class possibly from the home counties might be members of the national trust and you kind of go well that's great and they are absolutely you know right to be engaged with with the heritage of the uk but they must not be the only audience they must not be the only participants because then we are telling only a, only a sliver of the stories that ought to be told. Um, it becomes a kind of a, a cultural myopia that becomes the norm. And so we don't even realize that there are stories and perspectives missing. So I think stories enable new, I was gonna say audiences, but that sort of suggests that they're sitting back passively being um, talked at or receiving some kind of information, but actually it it should be. And, and this is where we come to the application of storytelling techniques and traditions of storytelling. I think it's it's actually about a, a shared creation. That's where the real power of, of, of good storytelling comes. It's not me telling you stuff. It's about us together creating something unique and extraordinary. Well, I have to admit, I don't, I don't like stories with morals. I mean, you know that that <laughs> I don't like being told what to think, and I don't. And good storytelling doesn't do that. Good storytelling quite often is biased, and obviously you're going to tell it from your point of view. And I mean, I definitely do that, but I'm also very open about that. And you can, you'll know exactly what I think when I tell you a story. <laughs> but the, but it raises questions. Mm. A story is, is is a place for debate. It should be open ended, and it's there's 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 pliability and possibility in there, and it is space to explore a narrative and to think is that is that the way it is? Is that the way that it should be? It's not a this 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 this. It's it, it's an open. It is an open space for me. I think that's really important, and um, and you've you've kind of skipped. It. I've got a list of questions of things that I thought we might. Oh, talk I'm so about. sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. This is great. It's great. And uh, but you've just whizzed past where I was going <laughs> to build to because I think it is really important. Is how do we make sure that traditional stories and histories of our landscape and heritage are accessible to people from diverse backgrounds? Because I think it is a real issue that when people um start to look at folklore start to look at very land-based mythology and um land-based land -based discoveries it can be uh, exclusive and it can make people feel that they don't have a connection to that and they're not involved um and that's definitely something is a, a m massive aspect of my work at the moment of um and i i have some answers to that but i'm really interested in more yeah you're right I think it can and I think um I mean I okay so my mum is Indian my dad uh his family were Polish and they came over after the second world war and I grew up in Cheshire in the northwest and I, I live in the southeast now in Hertfordshire I'm married to a man whose family are Jewish but he's not practicing I never know what to put on the form for my kids you know like oh god I'm like they're they're all all of the above can I tick where's that box um and I have certainly had experiences where I've been talking about the ancestors or our ancestors you know I'm talking about mm, I don't know West Kennet Long Barrow in Wiltshire it's quite close to Avebury some people all know it it's 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 brilliant if you haven't been go 
It's this um, long chambered tomb. It's totally free to get in. You park up in a kind of cruddy lay by, follow up a footpath up the hill. And then you have basically a five and a half thousand year old tomb to explore at your leisure. And you can go into the chambers. You can find the stone where it's been repurposed from being a, a ceremonial stone that was used for polishing ceremonial stone axes. Uh, the, the, the fancy word is polissoir or polisher stone. And it's been reused by Neolithic late Stone Age people and incorporated into their tomb because they too had a sense of history and story and relevance of artefacts and how to make sense of <laughs> it's amazing what you just happen to have sitting next to you and just thinking there it is you need to polish I don't know what he's gonna do with it folks i'm <laughs> glad we're on zoom i didn't know you're gonna start talking about axes sorry <laughs> um and um and uh oh but the, this one before metal so no metal so yeah. it would have been a, a beautiful polished kind of stone sort of um they're sort of like ob oblongy um but, so you can actually oh. touch things when you go there it's not oh. cordoned off it's yeah. It's completely access. So you could actually take a stone axe and like and polish it in there, which would just Oh, well, don't do that because you would damage the monument. So don't do that. But you could polish your own stone axe next to the polisher stone. Yeah. Just bring your own polishing kit or something like that. You can do all manner of things. The last time I went in there, there was someone quietly drumming and chanting to the ancestors. And then um, I just sort of sat quietly and let them get on. I sort of just bore witness to their ritual. And I thought, well, they might have just made it up but i love it it's cool it, it you know it means this place still has sacred significance to people five and a half thousand years after the first people built a thing here now and the first people who built the thing there were probably building on a tradition culturally emotionally psychologically building on a tradition of that place being significant in some other way it's just that we don't have the evidence because now there's a big old tomb on top um so so if I'm standing there and I'm talking about our ancestors, I don't know entirely that I'm talking about literally my ancestors. You know, I can't trace the family tree that ultimately ends me back in East Africa, you know, kind of dropping out of the trees. And my 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 little root and branch and twig doesn't necessarily overlap with the root branch and twig of the person who was you know heaving that enormous great sandstone block into position but I feel like I have a shared sense of belonging uh a, a belonging of place a belonging of con continuity because that landscape is important to me and because I live here now in these islands and so it's not about a sort of sanguine line. It's about a, a shared sort of passing on of heritage line. Um, and I think I think the, the term ancestors can be very powerful for people, but it can also be very polarizing and effectively discriminatory because perhaps someone who is the child of someone who um, is a, a, a windrush um immigrant might go well that, when you say our ancestors you explicitly exclude me because they are not my ancestors and I go well they're not my ancestors either um and I think we have to definitely be mindful and certainly people who are in those big heritage organizations who might possibly not have Indian and Polish parents and kind of um they, they might look that the, the the perception might be that when they say our ancestors, they mean some kind of, you know, it feeds into this kind of rhetoric of Anglo-Saxons or the original people here. But let's be honest, the first lot of people who came to the British Isles weren't Homo sapiens. They were a, a prior species and they were parked on the banks of the Paleo Thames. So the river that eventually becomes the River Thames. 700,000 years ago, chopping up stone tools and eating things. And then at some point they die or they wander back across the land to, to what is now the Netherlands or France. After that, there's a massive gaping hole of Ice Age come, Ice Age go, Ice Age come, Ice Age go. And then you've got a few people, you know, who we only ever notice them when they're, you know, they've either chopped up a, a, a woolly mammoth we find a little bit of bone. So the earliest uh, human burial that we have that has survived that we know about 
is from about 33,000 years ago, and that was found in a cave on the Gower Peninsula in South Wales. Um, that person, let's call them an original ancestor because they were Homo sapiens, um, so our species of human. Who are they related to? I don't know. Probably maybe not someone in the Netherlands either. Maybe someone who is most closely related to someone, I don't know, I don't know, Bremen in Germany? We don't know, do we? Because people have moved so much and you create identity. You're not born into it. I mean, we we tell ourselves these narratives about these kind of definitive, ossified truths about who we really are. But but I think, again, as you were saying, story is incredibly powerful because it creates open spaces. So. So, no, the, the Neolithic farmers, they were usurpers. They trotted over on boats with with pigs and stuff, corn, new types of wheat. So the Mesolithic hunter-gatherers who were there before, they sort of seemed to disappear from the genetic uh, pool, but that might have just been because there weren't very many of them. Then you get all these Neolithic farmers, then you get new people turning up who, who have Bronze Age technology, then you get new people in the Iron Age, and you kind of get these like peripheries where people hang on or you get continuities of tool styles and things like that. And then it takes ages before you get to anyone who would ever consider themselves Anglo-Saxon. And Angles and Saxons, they're from different places anyway. And at the same time, you had Jutes. And then you've got Vikings, and then you've got Normans, and then you've got Huguenot refugees. And then, you, oh, just when you say, you know, the white British people, you go, which ones? So I'm, I'm a big fan of ancestors as a catch-all term for continuity of identity, not continuity of bloodline. Because, I mean, that's just a made up notion anyway, let's be honest. I'm I'm very, very with you on, on all of that. And I suppose it's just that thing, isn't it, of kind of of how you present it. So mm -hmm. reaching out and just being very clear about about that, about and literally kind of spelling out what what do you mean so that it doesn't feel um, like a barrier. Because I also feel like wherever you go, if you learn this, the stories of that place it's a way of connecting you to that land it's a it's a way of learning the layers of that land it's a way of, of, of forming a relationship and a conversation with the place that you are um and and i would want people to do that coming to shropshire i don't care where they've come from but once you're here it's such a beautiful place and it's got such a lot of history and um and just such a a, a rich place but and it's got a, a very very distinct character I'd want people to get to know that, and um, and anybody who comes here has a right to tell those stories. Do you know what I mean? And, and if yeah, I, when exactly. I go to other places, that's how I start to form a relationship with them. Um, but I'm also aware that that sometimes it can people don't. I, I need to explain that. I need to be very specific about it, um, I think, and, and I think... put out an invitation to do that. Yeah. And I think I think when you're telling someone else's story, the difference is whether you're appropriating it and claiming it as your own. And it becomes effectively a continuity of a, a sort of an imperial, you know, exploitative relationship with the others or whether it's actually something that's much more humble, much more. Um, authentic, I guess, much more human. Um, that acknowledges a, a depth of, of historical injustice that is very real and still alive in many of our sort of cultural systems and legacies of, of racism and misogyny and all the rest of it. But I think that maybe that's where artists, storytellers have opportunity to reach out with a different energy and create something that is that is kind of vulnerable rather than acquisitive um, and beautiful and new and creative and actually creates new spaces for those those identities, those histories, those new futures to be explored and imagined. Yeah, definitely. And I think, yeah, I think it's a very different thing listening to stories and telling stories. And there are certain places I would go and I'd want to make a connection with that land and I would listen to the stories of that place. It doesn't need to be me who tells them. Sometimes you can just invite somebody else to tell them and create a space for other people to tell them and it's they're not your stories to tell. Yeah, so, exactly. You 
And I think I think it goes again back to the notion of, well, who are the gatekeepers? Who gets to say what is or isn't culture or what is or isn't heritage? What does or doesn't count? And in, in very literal terms, that might be who does or doesn't get the grant funding or who does or doesn't get the place on the talks schedule at the you know regional museum or what have you. Um, and I think so I, I host events for um, the British Museum, the British Library, but I'm thinking of the British Museum particularly just in the course of this conversation. They have a, a profound, a sort of visceral awareness of the origins of their institution and what their collections represent to some people, which is brutish uh colonial theft and it's it's kind of it's really refreshing to actually work with um, members of the events team who are who try really hard to work out ways to explore ideas of heritage and culture that aren't um kind of pouring salt into those wounds, but actually finding new ways of reaching different audiences and empowering them to be part of part of it, part of the conversation. Yeah. So when this you... feels like a really exciting time to me because I have to admit, I mean, I've always loved storytelling and, um, and I've always been interested in anthropology and archaeology. And I definitely felt when I first started to sort of explore into anthropology and archaeology that um storytelling was definitely very much a lesser relation not taken seriously um and particularly with anthropologists kind of at storytelling seen as very working class or you know the the not as evolved people telling that and <laughs> kind of you know you've got the <laughs> academics who will take a a, a tradition bearer and uh, and the tradition bearer won't get paid the tradition bearer, bearer gives all of the story i mean like, grims is classic for this you know um gives all of the stories and gets a pat on the head and then the researcher the academic goes takes all the credit gets all the money and um and and is very patronizing and dismissive of their actual source and it's one of those things that really put me off um, that place and it felt like archaeology could kind of be similar as well like you know kind of just looking back as oh yes well those um unevolved people and you know brought you know older civilizations before they'd become you know yeah or, or the, the kind of modern civilizations <laughs> yeah exactly the, the sort of the uncritical um comparison of looking at i don't know a medieval longhouse and going ah oh, yes well of course there's stories about the role of cattle and then they wheel out someone who is alive who is not a medieval farmer and and they kind of go look it's the same ah oh, the people of shropshire they haven't changed ha <laughs> ha peasants yeah exactly that exactly that um That's so something. So it's really interesting having you on to talk about the role of storytelling in archaeology now. Ah, oh, with the peasants. Is yeah. it still like that? Are we still peasants with when we look to wow. the oral culture and traditional storytelling? I don't know. Well, because I get lumped into a different category of of of, of mockery and sort of lowliness because I'm a you know TV person. I'm not a proper academic, so I can't speak for the proper <laughs> academics. But the ones that I the ones that I'm friends with totally appreciate that I think you're right Amy that that has very much been the case and I think it's born of the fact that a lot of those sort of academic traditions were established some of the rules of engagement were established at the same time as those pith helmeted Victorians were trundling off around the the colonial empires um acquiring you know they'd, they'd go and collect all the butterflies and pin them into into cases they'd you know collect a specimen of a you know a native's head literally a skull or a you know taxidermied head in some occasions is <clears throat> and acquiring those sort of cultural artifacts so you know whether it's a, a polynesian stick chart that shows the the kind of the waves and and the way that they would learn um how to navigate between different islands 
in in the Pacific or the Indian Oceans, or whether it's kind of getting a warbling, you know, very early uh, recording of a of a, an oral story or a folk song or something like that. It's about sort of completing the set. It's about collecting and categorizing. And so you find those old storybooks, don't you, where you've um, books of stories, I mean, of traditional tales, where it's all in categories and sort of cross-referenced. Well, this one references fairies and green men and fields of wheat. And this one references, you know, um, Mary and blood. And, and you kind of go, ah, it makes it like a butterfly pinned into a into a case. It it just like the butterfly, it's not alive anymore. Um, and I think there is an acknowledgement now that that these are traditions that have depth of continuity, but they are alive and they are different. And you can't just put them in a little box and then you've done the work. Um, it's sort of you're, you're kind of missing the point at that point. It's like it's like um, not really paying attention to the art that someone has created. Instead, you're actually just putting samples of the color on a, the the paint colors on a sheet, and then you can do an analysis of what different components of dyes go into the paint. But you go, yes, but you've missed the point that these are the components of art. Look at the picture. Look at the artist. You know what does it say to you? Don't just tell me that that's carnelian or whatever it does feel like things are i mean not there but but changing i mean one of the exciting things um for me was when i realized that unesco had um recognized intangible heritage as a thing so obviously unesco do the world heritage sites they do all of the kind of the wonders the modern wonders of the world um <clears throat> i was involved in a project around the pongsal aqueduct when that was being designated as a world heritage site and a big part of that was um was the project that i was involved in which was collecting the oral history and really Ooh, kind nice. of getting the yeah, and 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 people's memories of that, and and the history of the punk salt aqueduct, and how people felt about it, and it was really um, exciting. And uh, and now there's a whole kind of there are designated um, places um, and and specific cultural practices of intangible heritage, and part of the definition um, is that they are they are evolving that. Um, you can't just go right th this is it and that's how it's going to stay you have to allow it to breathe and mm. to change and that is part of what that heritage is and there's still sort of there's still a lot of people kind of discussing what intangible heritage is and how you create it how you look after it but just the fact that they're doing it for me is is hugely exciting and and has given it a sort of stamp of approval and authority that i don't think was them i think they was it 2003 the first conference where they kind of um uh that was suggested and i think it came into force in 2008 something like that and i think actually one of the other things that it's it's done is it's caused people to reflect on other aspects of protected heritage that previously didn't appear to be you know tricksy so for example so i'm involved with um landscape archaeology and, and thinking about the historic landscape and more and more there are conversations about for example in the the lake district in england in cumbria um part of the cultural heritage her cultural heritage that is protected as the part of the lake district world heritage site is cumbrian hill farming and this is sheep farming on the marginal land of the fells and so it maintains them in a way that we find familiar now which is basically treeless they ought not to be treeless and it's terrible for the environment that they are so heavily grazed um, because you can't have any natural regeneration and so one of the questions is actually how do we enable these environments these habitats these landscapes to be healthy to serve future generations and yet retain something of the aesthetic principles the character the landscape character properties um and maintain for example a tradition of sheep hill farming where where sheep are hefted to the land um which means that they know which fell is theirs and the mother sheep teach the lambs where this this is your patch uh, and they don't tend to stray beyond because they learn like this is where they belong 
And the people who've been farming on these landscapes for generations feel similarly hefted in many ways. And I think the stories are hefted. But we also, like you say, that the landscape needs to breathe. It needs to change because we need it to not stay in this state. You know, it's kind of, um, I guess in a sort of quite crude comparison would be you look at a, a an inner city estate that has had you know that the infrastructure is crumbling and there's someone dealing drugs on the corner and there's broken glass everywhere and you go we have to keep it like this because <laughs> this is how it's supposed to be and you go no it really isn't and we're doing a massive disservice to all the people who live here um you know sure it's brutalist architecture but it's also a really brutal place to live and that needs to change that's not okay we can't just kind of stand there with stroking our middle class beards going oh yeah it's good yeah um so I think yeah that the intangible the, the role of intangible heritage is coming to the fore and it's also bled into more nuanced more sophisticated questions around all the other kinds of heritage too so I think it's sort of served a double purpose yeah it does seem like exciting times to be around around mm. in it and, and maybe people will be looking more about um about the things that are held in in the memory of stories um and I don't know how often that is used I mean certainly when I'm kind of researching stories and learning stories there are things that come up and I go and, and bits in a story will go oh can I change that or I don't know if I should leave that in but then um it turns out that there's actually a, a proper geographical thing that I didn't know about that was really important. So, for example, um, you know, kind of the stories, the Rikin near me, and there's lots of kind of, is it a volcano? Is it kind of, has it been dumped by a um, uh, glacial deposit? And it's sort of, so you, ha and there's quite a lot of stories, I was saying, in Britain about um, earth moving giants. And when yeah. you start looking at kind of glacial Double activity. dropping stones out of their aprons, all that sort of stuff, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, particularly but with the big mountains and things, you kind of look at it and go, well, yeah, a glacier kind of is a giant. <laughs> you know, you yeah. it absolutely is a giant. And when you start looking into it, you go, oh. And there's there's another story that the devil and the diaper stones, and he goes to Ireland to get this stone and dumps it down. And you go, why is he going to Ireland? But then you start looking at the stone and go, well, actually, this is the sort of stone that is found in that bit of Ireland. And actually, there's nothing else around here that's like that. So somehow... It is connected with that. Mm. Don't know how. And are archaeologists using those stories in at all to give clues? Are they looking at folklore mythology? Yeah. So a really famous example of that is actually um, Stonehenge. So some of you will know that Stonehenge is there's a number of different kinds of stone, but the two main types of stone are the sarsen stones. So the really big ones that form the trilithons. So, you know, you've kind of got two uprights and a, a lintel, the kind of the stone that sits on top. And they're the really massive, massive ones. And then around them, you've got smaller, massive stones, still taller than me. Um, still, you know, a, a, few, a few tons each, but they're um, called blue stones. And that's a kind of loose geological term for lots of different types of stone but all ones which you find in outcrops in southwest Wales and around an area called Priscelli, Priscelli Hills and they have geologically they've been able to identify not just the area of the country where these stones must have been brought from but specific outcrops and if you go it's it's really brilliant if you want a kind of jaunt up onto kind of a windswept moor go to the Priscelli Hills and go and explore the the bluestone outcrops because it is it is a magical place and you can go and and there's kind of these fingers of rock sticking up that are sort of natural bluestones and if you look carefully, you'll see some of the blue stones that didn't get transported, that have been kind of prized out of the outcrop, but then left. And there's lots and lots of stories about what these stones represented. Why was this place special? How come these stones got chosen? Because it's about 140 miles to either drag them, to float them, to roll them on rollers, you know, some whichever way you get them to Wiltshire, it's a massive pain in the arse. So you have to be doing it for some uh, for some reason. Now, the most likely theory is that actually people in West Wales took these blue stones that sort of um, got them got them out of the out of the earth, as it were, and they were a, another monument somewhere. 
before the whole monument gets dismantled and taken to, to be incorporated into Stonehenge. So we don't know where this mysterious missing monument is or was um, a particular archaeological conundrum, because the only thing we know about this site is that there is not a monument there anymore. So it's, you know, it's like looking for the needle in the haystack where the needle is not there anymore. You know that for sure. And you're kind of going, is it this haystack? Don't know. Um, so chances are we're never going to find out where this interim monument was. Was it in Wales? Was it somewhere in between the two? Was it somewhere in Wiltshire? Who knows? <coughs> but one of the th one of the stories that got told about Stonehenge, uh, written down in the sort of early medieval period in the first in the first instance, was that an I uh, 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 Merlin the you know the the wizard from the tales of king arthur commands a giant to bring the stones of stonehenge from ireland from ireland again and one of the interpretations is ah oh, hang on well maybe when they say ireland they mean the west because you know something coming from ireland and something coming from west wales would probably have actually come you know the last few dozens of miles come on exactly the same route or perhaps if it was floated down the river for a, sh a short period of time before then it came over land you wouldn't know at the point it reaches um uh stonehenge salisbury plain whether it was from ireland or somewhere sort of near ireland because no one's sitting there with an aa road map going oh yes or google maps working out exactly the route um or maybe there was a mistranslation at some point or a mis a mistelling of you know it's from the west and some in, someone interpreted the no, storytellers exaggerating yeah, i know it's terrible <laughs> the fish was this big um so so i kind of i kind of love that idea but i do sometimes wonder whether that's kind of archaeologists desperately searching for a story to fit the evidence if you know what i mean because then you go oh you see and also it's a it's a living tradition that we still tell this story about the stones that came from ireland you go wow well, yeah but there's loads of other monuments where the story is a giant brought them from somewhere. Sometimes it's Ireland. Sometimes it's, you know, the other side of the valley. Sometimes it's the other side of beyond the sea. Um, I mean, it comes up again as well, actually. Every now and then I, I kind of get invited to be a talking head on, on a history show that gets kind of broadcast around the uh, internationally. So it kind of gets sold to lots of different territories. And one of the things that people love talking about is um, sort of ancient universal myths. And the flood is the one that always comes up. And they go, well, you know, there were ancient floods. So is this the origin of the flood in, in the Bible or the flood in the Mesopotamian stories or the flood in um, uh, Australian uh, native Aboriginal stories? And you're like, well, I mean, there were a lot of floods, sure. And some of them would have been very memorable. But um, I don't think Noah ever wandered about with a boat and ended up on the top of a mountain. No. I don't think that means it's true necessarily. Apologies to people who are religious. <laughs> There's different types of truth anyway. Ah, different <laughs> types of truth. Absolutely. Yes, I've been, I've been, uh, yes, quite right, Amy, quite right too. Yeah, and I mean, so, well, yeah, in, in Shropshire, I mean, there's, there's, wherever you go in Shropshire, there's definitely, there's like a story of the drought. And there was obviously a really big drought at some point. Um, so, you know, it doesn't need to be a worldwide one or a, Bibli, bibli, you know, bibliographic one or um mm -hmm. but there was at some point obviously a big drought in Shropshire that was remembered and was a big deal that kind of went on for several years and was was tricky times because it it does seem to be that everywhere you go in Shropshire this one. Mm. Um and I think but also I think one of the things that we have to remember is that for it to have a sort of a, a grounding in a thing that really happened doesn't make it a better story or a more valid story or more important story. And sometimes humans simply have the one of the things that makes us so good at being human is that we have this incredible ability to be highly social, very thoughtful and to share um, abstract notions with each other and build abstract ideas together. And that's why we have things like religion and, you know, the idea of money cryptocurrency I mean like what is that I don't know but we have all agreed it's a thing and so now it is a thing um and and so I think I think we have an extraordinary ability to imagine the pain of 
losing everything because the waters rise because you all you need to do is stare at the sea or stare at a lake and think oh my goodness imagine if the water came up and up and up and up and you start to tell you can tell stories and those stories have incredible power because they tap into deep fears they might not be literal fears or or dreams or imaginings I mean I think that's the kind of the wonderful thing about not only traditional stories but the the traditions of oral storytelling you can play with those ideas that they're not you know like you say kind of frozen in time that this is how it was told in 1775 and so this is how it shall always be told your your job as storytellers is to make it relevant for every person who listens so we haven't got a lot of time left Sadly, so this if if um, if anybody has burning questions that they want to stick in the Q and A, this is the time to do it. Um, I have obviously I've got a whole bunch of questions that I still want to ask, so I'm going to ask at least one more while other people are thinking, and you can put it into okay. the Q and A. And I suppose my thing is, I know that uh, it's relatively recently that you discovered that storytelling is an art form, that storytelling does still exist, that storytelling yeah. is a thing, and I'm really interested in what impact that has had on on your work and what you think the biggest impact that maybe storytelling has and the biggest possibilities that it's got in terms of archaeology and where you think the the strongest links are? So I think I've always had this sort of reverential feeling of, of people who have that, who are the, as you described them so beautifully, tradition bearers, people who have that repository of stories and have the um, seeming authority to tell and skills to tell and like hold you with the magic and I've kind of always gone oh that's brilliant I want to do that but how and very serendipitously I was introduced by a mutual friend to someone called Jason Book who is a storyteller who I know you know Amy because you and Jason sometimes work together and he said oh I love archaeology and I went I love storytelling we should talk and we actually to his absolute credit I said oh here's my email address send me send me an email send me an email and he actually did and we met up and we decided that we thought maybe there was something exciting to be done taking real archaeological artifacts and telling stories so either telling stories about them or telling stories that from a sort of traditional Additional repository that there is some kind of link either thematic or tonal or something where basically an audience member could perhaps learn about something a, a real artifact a real artifact and also be transported by the imaginative potential of a story so sometimes a story about an artifact and sometimes a story that fits an artifact uh, or a site, something where it did happen or it could have happened. Um, and we sort of take the facts and then make an imaginative leap. And it was, it was genuinely supremely exciting and absolutely terrifying to have this opportunity because that thing where I was like, oh, I'd love to do that. Suddenly I had to actually do it. Um, and I, attended a, a storytelling workshop that Jason and a, another storyteller called Mike Rogers were running about how to learn how to tell a story. And it was it was so brilliant. Um, they were kind of really easy to grasp, but very, very hard to master sort of basic beginner's techniques, which is like, learning the skeleton of a story so you know kind of what beats you're going to hit but then it creating space you know so you've got the ribs but then your job as a storyteller is to kind of fill in the flesh and that's live so you're not learning a script you're not delivering a monologue <laughs> excuse me um and as a as a tv presenter as a, a kind of writer of non-fiction I'm not allowed to make it up or I have to really flag up when I'm making it up. I can sort of speculate and say, well, some people think that maybe this and here's the evidence. Whereas this was sort of carte blanche to go tell, you know, at the beginning, when the people have walked in through the door, they know they're here for storytelling. So you don't need to go. I mean, you can go, 
And who knows if this story is true? But you don't need to because they're already signed up. And so your job is to 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 just go for it. And it was it was kind of wonderful and absolutely terrifying. And it's definitely still doing a, a show where I'm telling a story is um, still the most terrifying thing to do. Like I'd much, much rather stand in an auditorium of, you know, 3000 people or broadcast live on, on the news than, um, well, I say much rather, you get just such a wonderful level of, of feedback. And when you know it's working and you are doing that thing where you're sort of co-creating with your audience, this special live moment, it is absolutely magic. I mean, it's, it's um, yeah, it's the good drugs, <laughs> but um, it's also hugely exposing. Yeah, hugely exposing. And and the physicality of it was something that I'm, you know, I'm I'm very much at the start of a, a journey that I hope will be something that when I'm kind of old and venerable and I walk in with my stick and wizened face, um, it's something that I may be good at by then. And people go, oh, she's here, she's here, the storyteller. <laughs> um, yeah. But um, it's, yeah, the physicality, because when you're presenting for TV, it has to be entirely like I'm just having a conversation with you because otherwise you sound like some kind of pantomime dame. It just sounds so ridiculous and it's big and it's very different. And you sound like Brian Blessed and it just sounds like you're making it up or that you're not credible. And you have to pretend that the camera is just one person who you're having a normal conversation with over lunch. You know, oh, the Caesar salad. Yeah, you're having that. And then I'm going to tell you about this thing about Nefertiti. Um, where storytelling requires different registers. It requires different, um, well, I don't know why I'm telling you, but, um, you know, all <laughs> the different techniques, the physical techniques, the kind of the lyrical techniques, the way that you can vary your voice, the way you can change the energy in the room. It's really exciting. It's like suddenly having a kind of an orchestra to play with, of all these other things that you can do. Um but equally, it means that you have to master it. And yeah, that's a challenge. And has it made you go back and then look at the artifacts and the places in a different light? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, so writing original stories with Jason for our uh, Secret Histories shows. There's one, it was the, it was an artifact that was in the very first show that we devised. Um, and it's a, a mourning ring, actually from Shropshire, from Bridge North. Um, and it was a uh, it was commissioned by a vicar of a parish church, and the the person who found it, it was a metal detectorist who found it, this like really simple little gold and enamel ring, but it had writing on each of the panels around it, and a metal detectorist discovered it in a field and did the research they they went and looked at the archives and kind of said it says mary and sarah littleton and then it's got a death date on it and they discovered that mary and sarah littleton were a mother and a baby who um who were in the parish records and they were the wife and child of the vicar and they died the day after the baby was born so obviously effectively in childbirth um, just long enough for the baby to ba be baptised. So the lines in the parish register are Sarah Littleton baptised, and then the next line is Mary Littleton died, Sarah Littleton died. And so it's this profoundly tragic, in some ways, everyday story of, 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 of grief and loss and love. And writing a story about that um, enabled me, I guess, caused me, uh, invited me to look at that artifact in a in a different way, in a sort of lyrical way. So there's one little bit where we we talk about the line, a, a scratch in the enamel underscores Mary, and how um, the the kind of the gold of the the ring is more permanent and more solid than the baby it remembers because the baby lived for a day. And the scratch in the enamel is a real scratch and it underscores the M of Mary. And I don't know that I would ever have noticed that, except that I was looking at this artifact with with different eyes, with a different sort of different brain, different head on. Um, 
and kind of it felt a little bit like thinking about the artifact in perhaps the way that the person who wore it would have looked and scrutinized it and and felt it felt it on a, a different register to you know it's this many millimeters in diameter and it weighs this many grams and you know it's in this condition and it was discovered in this you know gps location or what have you it's it's kind of you go that all that information is super important but now what does it mean on on human terms and and that that's a, a wonderful gift and i think i've definitely taken that into into my writing into my writing for secret britain as well um uh, which was the book that you very kindly um held up earlier <laughs> available in all good bookshops but also from my website if you want a, a signed copy um yeah because each of those it's about 75 just uh, just over 75 artifacts and sites and I sort of tell tell the background of what the thing is but also I don't write stories explicitly but it's kind of telling exploring perhaps or raising provoking some of those questions like why is this place still significant or what did this this artifact mean um could it be this could it be that and I, I hope that secret britain could be the foundation for people perhaps looking at artifacts and going oh i never knew about that and it just lets them create a story of their own you know um i think i think yeah i I completely agree. And I think you've just expressed it so beautifully with that story because all the facts are, are important and they tell us all of those details, but then storytelling is the bridge to to connect us to those people, isn't it? It's kind of, it brings everybody into the same or can bring everybody into the same time so that you yeah, meet those exactly. people in the now and you meet them as, as, as people with real lives and a real arc of their lives. And they, they, um, and it's that thing of kind of using intangible, something intangible, something you can't see or feel or anything to actually make other things real. Yeah, um, exactly. And in so, a way that physical artifacts just can't. But yeah. when you bring them together, yeah, they do. It's um, the intangible and the tangible coming together. Yeah, because it's the thing that, so so my, my two kind of most formative experiences on archeology span digs, one was the very first dig that I went on, um, I helped as a volunteer excavating a medieval cemetery in uh, just near Chester. And one of the people, one of the burials that we were excavating, the person had broken their finger and it had fused and it was sort of like a little hook finger. And, and the rest of the bones of the hand were there, but there was one finger that was hooked. And I kind of just, I kind of picked up this finger and kind of went, A, this is a person's finger, but B, it was just this really visceral very individual detail about this man who'd been alive and dead you know 500 years ago or maybe 600 years ago and he had a crooked finger and it must have hurt a bit in the cold you know and it didn't stop him he died as an old man and he said you know it had fused and it had gone a bit arthritic -y and it must have been a bit sore and maybe he got someone to rub ointment in it or whatever and it was just it was it was old bones and then it became a person I think that then that is just the yeah that is the moment of of being human isn't it then yeah exactly exactly and um and and the the other one was was more recently it was a site called Chester Farm in in Northampton and um I found a, a Roman hairpin a bone hairpin that had, um we were excavating a ditch and I said I'd only turned up for the day and they went oh yeah sit you know sit next to them and they'll they'll keep an eye on you because I was like oh don't leave me alone I might do something wrong um and, and found this beautiful, exquisite, it wasn't broken. And it was about 1800 years old. That's when the site was uh, dated to. And maybe it fell out of someone's hair when they were bending over, putting the bucket of slops into the ditch. And um, and they go, oh, where's my hairpin? Oh. And, and I'm the next person, 1800 years later, holding this hairpin, just going, God, this is like, am I allowed to... It, it's a, it's so brilliant so human so every day and yet so special because suddenly there was my hands connecting with someone's life from 1800 years ago who also knew that bit of that muddy corner of that field in Northamptonshire just in the way that I was kneeling in the mud um and you kind of just go oh you know that is, is priceless Brilliant. 
thank you so much, Marianne, for coming and for for sharing this space and this time and your expertise and your knowledge with us. It's been just fantastic to have chance to to talk and <clears throat> to dig down a little bit ourselves. And if you want to know more of Marianne's stories, obviously we've 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 shown you Secret Britain quite a bit. She does have other books. She does. And, <laughs> and um, you know, Richard was saying, uh, are there podcasts? And I believe there are. I'm not sure if it's about giving the object to reference a real narrative of its history through evidence interpretation, but but I know you have been involved in podcasts. I have. I haven't done any podcasts about archaeology and storytelling, though. Um, maybe that's something that I should consider for the future. I did record one story, which is on YouTube. Um, and that was my sort of, it was an imaginative interpretation of the Sutton Who helmet. Um, and I imagine that King Radwald, who is the person who's probably the ship burial, where, where this Sutton Who helmet was buried. Um, I imagine that his wife, the Queen, puts the helmet on because she's annoyed with him. <laughs> it's transported because it's a magical helmet because it's actually woden uh, when you put the helmet on you become woden and um that was brilliant because you kind of get to play with the register of like proper like beowulf style poet what um which which is quite fun so you can find that on youtube but um podcasts no i haven't done any maybe we should yeah well, I bet maybe, maybe we should. Yes, maybe we should. Cool. I definitely want to do more collaborations with storytellers um, in the landscape um, as as a way of, as an entirely legitimate way of exploring and interpreting history and archaeology. Absolutely for sure, because it brings a different audience. It brings a different energy. It brings, it brings a different truth to uh, to these things. I think that'd be really exciting. I, yeah, yeah, it'd be good, really wouldn't exciting. it? I just yeah. need like... I need to get this book written and then I'll have fun with it. <laughs> right. Okay. So, yes, Easter. There we go. We should get started <laughs> yeah. on it. Um, right. Melanie's asking, oh, how do I save the chat? Because there are lots of great comments in here. Um, Melanie, you should be able to just do the three dots at the bottom right hand side. And then there is a message that says save chat if you click on those three dots. Um but I think it is time for us to wrap up tonight. As usual, I've gone over and apologies. I try and keep these things going. Oh, there's just so many things that I want to ask and there's lots more questions. But if you have enjoyed tonight, then please go and explore Marianne's work at www.mariannacotter.com. You can follow her on Twitter and Instagram at Marianna Cotter. And if you've enjoyed tonight, come back again. Um, we are usually here on the first Tuesday of the month. Uh, just a little bit late this month, give everybody a bit more time to come together. Um, but it's usually the first Tuesday and it will be the first Tuesday in January. It'll be the 3rd of January with Seth Townsend. And uh, we're going to be looking at, at, at storytelling with refugees. Um, Seth has done a huge amount of work um, telling, well, collecting stories that refugees bring with them, but also their own stories and the power of storytelling particularly within that setting and I think that's going to be quite a powerful evening and Seth is just amazing he's been all over the world and been in some brilliant situations but also some quite difficult ones so obviously be aware that's going to be an amazing conversation it may have triggers for some people um and please do subscribe to the Taking the Tradition on YouTube channel and you will find all of the past episodes of Taking the Tradition on there. So feel free to go and have a wonder and a nose. But for now, thank you very much for listening. Um, thank you very much for your questions and your comments. And of course, particularly, thank you so much Hooray! to Mary Ann Akotta. Good night. <laughs>